Welcome to episode number 45 of the Marine Lair podcast. We have on Kayla Bro of Root Sports, talk a little bit about Mariners outfielders, her career in broadcasting, and softball as well. We'll analyze Bryce Miller's up and down rookie season and our first impressions of Dom Canzone and Josh Rojas. Before we start the show, just a friendly reminder to all of you guys, go download our full-form audio podcast. You can do that on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon. Go follow us on those platforms. Go download the episodes. Give us a five-star review. It helps big time. And then head over to YouTube. Hit subscribe on YouTube as well. Watch our video podcast. Turn the, no- turn the notification bells on. Like, comment on those. And then if you want to head over to social media as well, you can check us out on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts at Marine Layer Pod. Let's get it rolling. And we welcome you to this episode of the Marine Layer Podcast, part of the Just Baseball Podcast Network, recording here on Monday, August 7th. And Lyle, I'm here today to pro- proclaim the Los Angeles Angels are dead. Oh, they've dug their own grave. Actually, what am I saying? They didn't dig their own grave. The Mariners dug it for them. Off the backs of, the, of hard work and hard labor of Cade Marlowe. Well, he certainly was the table setter. Maybe he was a little bit more than that when you hit a grand slam in the ninth inning off a guy in Carlos Estevez who hasn't blown a save all season. That'll set the table. Now, the series didn't exactly go in the Mariners' favor in terms of lopsided wins the rest of the weekend. But wins are wins, and they won every single game. Now here we sit. The Angels are seven games back of the last wild card spot after being as aggressive as any team in baseball at the deadline. What a story. You think Shohei's happy? I'm sure he's thrilled at this moment. His team actually showed that they cared a little bit and that they were going to go out and they were going to support him. Oh, wait, no. Every time we look in the, in the dugout and the TV cameras look in the dugout, he looks like a depressed individual. Well, considering they caught him almost crying on the broadcast, I'd say he's thrilled to be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's counting down the months. Under two months, Shohei. Un- under two months, and-, and you never have to go back again. And l- just over a month, we'll say five weeks, until he comes to Seattle for the Angels' final trip to Seattle this year, where, again, we'll do more promotion when it starts, but a little reminder again, just to get it in everybody's heads. We're drilling it in there. We're going to be there. We're going to be handing out into index cards with notes that say, come to Seattle. And we're going to be doing it all series. So get to the ballpark that weekend and let him hear it. Because I can tell you, after what we just watched last weekend, I don't think he wants to be in Anaheim. I think he's looking for a new home. And there's no and reason he can't be here. Need to show him as much as possible how much he's going to be loved. Let's let's get to the, the Mariner side of it before we get into our storylines, though. I mean, how nice is it to see... The, the close wins, which we were talking about earlier this season, how the one-run victories and the close victories just never seem to go their way. And yet, against all odds and extra innings where the Mariners have stunk all all season long, uh, on Sunday, Mariners are three high-leverage guys short in the bullpen, and it looks early that Bryce Miller might not have it and that he's getting hit around a little bit and it's hot and the bats aren't great, and yet the Mariners still find a way to finish off a sweep, and Taylor Saucedo goes the ninth and the 10th inning as the literally the last guy left in the bullpen. And it just kind of shows me where this Mariners team is at in terms of how they're feeling in, in winning games. And it feels like a little bit of that mojo from from last season and, and winning close games and doing all the right things, it's, it's there. They're, they've been playing inspired baseball since the deadline. First off, we have to give a spot on his own to Taylor Saucedo. He was awesome on Sunday. He's had a, he's had a phenomenal year. That was his best outing of the season. To slam the door he, the way he did in the ninth and the 10th to lock down that win, when, of course, he had to deal with an inherited runner in extra innings, didn't phase him. He shut him right down. Now, in terms of the one-run wins, this is more or less how a season will go in terms of close games for a team. Didn't ever feel like the Mariners were going to get any luck to turn their way early in the year when they would just lose every extra inning game possible. At least it felt that way. But all of a sudden, it's starting to turn around. I mean, that ball that hopped over the fence for a ground rule double in this series, I believe that was off the bat of Brandon Drury. Earlier in the year, that's not going over the fence. And the Mariners are on the wrong end of that. Angels probably win that game. They score score multiple runs on that hit. 
and they have to come back the next day. Instead, the Mariners catch a break. Munoz shuts it down on Saturday, and they win that game three. So you're starting to see the luck turn their way a little bit, which is more or less how one-run variance wins go. And you could say, oh, yeah, the Mariners were going to sweep this series while Luis Castillo was going to give up seven earned in his only start of the series. Yep, that's happening. And you look at the rest of that wild card picture all of a sudden, it's kind of the Mariners and everybody else. The Red Sox have had a tough last 10 games. The Yankees are now four and a half out. And if you ask any Yankee fan, they tell you their season's basically dead. I mean, you heard what Peter said on our last show, which go check that out if you hadn't. He was not all that inspired, to put it lightly, by Yankees baseball. I don't think most Yankee fans are. All of a sudden, you look at those wild card standings. Angels are seven back. Yankees are four and a half back. Red Sox are way back now. It's kind of the Mariners as that first team out with two and a half between them and the Blue Jays. And it's theirs for the taking if they want it. They control their own destiny. Well, let's get one last thing in here on the Angels that I forgot to mention. Uh, didn't you just love this new Anthony Rendon story this weekend? That he's, what, is he on the dead list? Yeah, he refuses to talk to reporters now because he's on the dead list. So he gave everybody the cold shoulder. What happened to this guy? People in D.C. loved Anthony Rendon. They thought he was a great guy. He was arguably the best player on that team. I mean, the year they won the World Series, he was right in the MVP race. He had that career year. And is there an is there a more unlikable player in baseball now than Anthony Rendon? I'm not sure. Well, he is the only player caught on video swinging at a fan this year. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And and this guy, I don't know, is this a hot take to say he was on a bit of a Hall of Fame trajectory when he was in Washington? And now he's just fallen off the planet. And you could say absolutely not. He would have been one of those guys where I wouldn't call him a slam dunk the way you would with some others, but he would be one of those guys where if he had kept up the pace he was on in D.C., he would have had a real case. Maybe it would have taken him a few years to get in if he had kept that pace up, but there would be people out there making very, very relevant cases for Anthony Rendon. Not anymore. He's on a terrible contract. He's never on the field, and now when he's in his extra time, his extracurricular activities involve trying to fight A's fans. Fighting A's fans and being an ass to the media. Th- those Correct. two things make you great. I don't think Andrew Jones did either of those things, but it kind of makes me uh, kind of makes me think of him a little bit. Moral of this story: I don't. I think Shohei's resigning there. Lifetime contract, seven hundred million. I mean, that's just a place you've got to be. Well, he he sits there and looks at Artie Moreno. Is like, well, if Rendon can get thirty eight million dollars a year, what am I worth? A hundred. At least. I think that's what it would take for him to stay. That's that's what it would take, Artie. And that might not even be enough because Otani, as politely as he possibly can, has expressed that he has a burning desire to win. Considering the two best players on the planet have been on the same team now for six years and they haven't sniffed the postseason, yeah, I, I'm pretty confident in saying he ain't going back there. Anyone see Mike Trout on the bench this weekend? What was he looking like? I'd love to pick that guy's brain off camera, off the record. Where are you at right now mentally with this franchise? <laughs> yeah. I would love to know. Please tell us, Mike. We would like to know. Okay, let's get to our Mariners storylines. Lyle, I have a burning question here for our first Mariners storyline. Why has Bryce Miller been so up and down? I think there's a couple things with this. Number one, this is sometimes how rookie seasons go. Look at Logan Gilbert in 2021. He certainly had his hills and valleys, and Logan Gilbert had more of an arsenal than Bryce Miller does in terms of pitches. Logan Gilbert had his good starts, and he'd have his really shaky starts. There were times in 2021 where Logan Gilbert had nothing but his fastball working, and that's all he would throw. This is how it goes sometimes. But if you look at Bryce Miller's last handful of starts, even two handfuls of starts, it's a different ball game than what it was looking like earlier in the year. His outings have not been as long. He's given up more hits. He's getting hit a little bit harder. Since about mid to late June, he just has not had that same effectiveness. You can chalk it up to a couple of things. One, he's really not been very good pitching on four days rest, which is the typical amount of rest you get in a rotation. This is a guy who had never pitched on four days rest in his career until getting to the big leagues. And with the delivery that he has and the concerns that a lot of scouts had when he was coming up, is that how is that delivery going to hold up over the course of a whole season 
over the course of a whole outing pitching seven innings? How's the velocity going to hold? How's the location going to hold? And as we've seen, it does kind of get spotty as the game goes along, depending on the opponent. There's a couple of things here. His hard hit rate has really skyrocketed this last bit. Now, I, I don't necessarily correlate that to him not holding his velocity very well. Funny enough, there was some concern on Saturday in that first inning, or Saturday, Sunday, when he's getting knocked around in the first inning about, well, is his fastball going to work? Well, his fastball ended up working pretty well that day, and he ended up holding his velocity very well, averaged 96 miles an hour for the entire game. But then there's these outings where he's sitting in the fourth and fifth inning, and he's tossing 92-93 on his fastball, and those are the pitches that are getting hit pretty hard. Fun fact, of the 10 home runs he has given up on his fastball this season, only one of those fastballs was above 94 miles an hour. Think about that. So when he's throwing hard, his fastball is generally a more effective pitch, as you would think. But when that velocity dips, that high spin fastball doesn't look quite as dangerous anymore. And with his shaky off speed pitches, it really comes back to bite him in that sense. That's what I think it really all boils down to. Like Logan as uh, as a as a rookie, if his fastball's on, he'll be on. If his fastball's not on, then buckle up. Along with the fact that when you are as fastball reliant as Bryce Miller is, he's about 65% fastballs in terms of his pitch selection. That will result in some outings where you just get hit harder. It happens. If guys are, t- are timing up your fastball, you will get hit around harder. He hasn't given up many home runs on high-velocity fastballs, but he has gotten hit around a little bit, especially in the last few weeks. If you look at a lot of his peripherals on Baseball Savant, it would suggest that as a lot of them are starting to trend in the wrong direction. Now, that doesn't mean he can't turn it around, but how can he do that? I think Bryce Miller has to develop a third pitch. I think he absolutely needs one. It's not going to happen in the middle of this season, this winter, this spring, this upcoming spring, I should say. He needs a third pitch. His his two pitches are great, the, th- the fastball and the slider, but something else has to be mixed in there to keep those hitters off balance. Even if you want to keep the high fastball percentage up, even if you still want to throw a lot of sliders, something else has to be mixed in at least every so often to keep guys on their toes. He should join the splitter club. I'm officially putting my stamp on that. Sure. Everybody else in this rotation has learned one. There's no reason Bryce Miller can't learn a splitter. I mean, hey, just ask any other guy in the rotation. Hey, how do I throw this? Results-wise, his slider has actually been pretty decent this year. The problem is that's just not really a strikeout pitch. I mean, he'll get some weak contact on it, and he generally kind of tries to throw it down in the strike zone. He did this last start against the angels on Sunday threw it in that down away corner to right, right hand hitters more than he has in any start this season. I was, I saw that on Twitter. I was like, Oh, that's interesting. So I went back and I looked at some of his previous starts and he really didn't have great command of that pitch. He's kind of spraying it all over the place. And Sunday was the first time he's, he's really commanded that pitch. Well, which is a good sign. So it's like, okay, so maybe another, uh, an off-speed pitch is actually coming along. That's reliable. That's you can throw for a strike or you can bury down a little bit. But the problem is it's not really a swing and miss pitch. Only has a 20% whiff rate, which is not a strikeout pitch. His best strikeout pitch is his fastball, but you kind of play with fire there because his fastball is also the pitch that more often than not gets hit the hardest, which, you know, when you're trying to put someone away, you'd rather throw a pitch that they a can't hit hard B can't hit at all rather than a pitch where if they don't, if they don't swing and miss, they're probably barreling it up to the outfield. We've highlighted this before too, right? There are guys in the majors that are starters that throw two pitches. Robbie Ray basically throws two pitches. Tyler glass now throws two pitches. Bryce Miller throws more fastballs than those guys. So because of that, because of the very high fastball usage, along with having two pitches, I think a third just needs to be mixed in there. Again, throwing a lot of fastballs is what he does best. It is his best pitch. But something else I think needs to be mixed in there just to give him some different results and find that second out pitch. His, his So the slider I was talking about was his gyro slider, the one that pretty much essentially goes down. Right. I didn't realize this at looking at the numbers until I actually looked at it. Uh, he did essentially ditch his sweeper. He threw it eight times against the Angels, but... In the previous two starts, I think he'd thrown it one time each because that pitch really had gotten crushed. He allowed a slugging percentage of over 700 against that pitch. And what was the name of that pitch? The cannonball? 
well, it was being cannonballed into the outfield over the wall because he was, he was not getting guys to swing and miss at that. So I would think based off the profile of pitches he would have, I think that splitter would be good, but we'll see. Cause that's, this is an off season project for him. Uh, and that'll, that'll be it. And improving command of that slider again, which he has not had great command until, uh, until Sunday, which command can almost be as important as, as making it just having a nasty pitch. It's good you highlighted that because when Miller came up, that's what we talked about is he had a fastball and he had two sliders. So the two sliders he threw were basically two off-speed pitches or two breaking balls. But now that he's ditched that sweeper, it is spe- it is strictly two pitches. So if he could add something with a little bit of a different shape or movement on it, like a splitter, which a lot of guys just use as a changeup instead now, that's what Logan Gilbert does. Yeah, that could really work for him. So Let's circle back to this next spring and see if he's made some adjustments. If I had to put some money on it, I would guess that he would. Second storyline here. Let's give an evaluation over the first week of the two newest Mariners, TJ. Dom Canzone, Josh Rojas. There's not a huge sample size, but we can take away what have we seen in the first week out of these guys. The one thing I will note first, let's start with Canzone, is that the Mariners trust him already he's hitting high in the lineup I mean he's hitting above guys like depending on the pitcher he's hitting above Cal Raleigh he's hitting above Teoscar Hernandez he if Jared Kelnick was in the lineup he would be hitting over Jared Kelnick that they have put some trust in him not been on the roster too long and not been in the big leagues too long they've been giving him some pretty big at bats mostly out of the five hole so far which is pretty interesting otherwise I mean it's just such a small sample. He's not striking out a lot. He's walking out of the league average rate. Um, the the most fun thing I found out while thinking of my evaluation of Dom Canzone over his first week with the Mariners is that this man hit 430 in the month of June in the minors. Does that Ridiculous. sound right? 430. He was too good for any level of the minor leagues. There's a reason he's up in the big leagues, and there's a reason the Mariners believe in him. You hit that well through all your levels of the minor leagues, which we highlighted on the show when they traded for him. Yeah, you're you're going to the majors. Now, it's not fair to expect Canzone, having less than 75 big league plate appearances, to just click right away. That's not going to happen. He needs some time to adjust, as does any big leaguer. But I think there's things to like about him early. Not just his track record in the minors, but the fact he doesn't strike out a lot, which is a very refreshing sign for an outfield that, like we talked about in the last show, We'll strike out a lot when it's the main three of Kel Julio and Teoscar. So he doesn't strike out a lot. Bat to ball is pretty good. I mean, you saw him spray that ball the other way for a double in left center field in one of his first few games at home in Seattle. So you can, he shows that he can go the other way a little bit. But there's only so much we can take away, and you just said the same thing. You, ho- you only play a handful of games so far like Canzone has. We're going to need a little bit more of a sample size. Because the other thing, too, is... He wasn't playing much in the Angels series. Angels have a bunch of lefty starters. They sat him as a result. We still need to see a little bit more. Yeah, that was the other thing. I I, I noted that him and Rojas, who we'll touch touch on, I mean, they've kind of paired him in a platoon here so far. I mean, if if uh, if there's a righty on the mound, those two play. If there's a lefty on the mound, they're putting Dylan Moore and Jose Caballero in the lineup instead. So there's kind of a balancing act, and I'm curious to see what their confidence level in Dom Canzone is to hit against lefties. Because, again, guys who are pretty good hitters, doesn't really matter if there's a lefty or a righty on the mound. But since baseball is a traditional sport and some lefties struggle against lefties, that's that's what happens. So at this point, it kind of shrugs and he's playing more than he played in Arizona. But I think consistent at-bats are pro- is pretty important here to Dom Canzone. And if there's an easy lefty on the mound, no, I don't really see why not. I would guess this is their way to ease him in. It's just their way of getting him acclimated. And then they'll start to mix him in against more lefties because you're right. I think they see him as a guy that can make impact and serious impact in the lineup long term with what he does at the plate. And if that's the case, yeah, he's going to be playing every day. I think, again, with less than 20 big league games, they're just easing him in. And Dylan Moore's been pretty good. So I'll give him to that. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. Dylan Moore and Ken Zone in the lineup at the same time and Caballero and Rojas on the bench. Sounds 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 like a win for both parties. Sure. I am the last person you ever have to tell, get Dylan Moore more playing time. Can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth, but I, I've come to appreciate. Can't believe to appreciate. 2021, or sorry, no, yeah. 2022, TJ, 
is is shuddering. I think you were fed up. I think you were fed up with them in 21 when I was already on board the hype train. And when I was on the hype train again in 2022, you just rolled your eyes until you finally got to the point where I had radicalized you enough to realize, oh, yeah, this guy's good and he provides value. Mm -hmm. Now, Rojas, um, I think it's very much what we expected. Hasn't hit the ball all that hard. Only had six at bats up in, in this lineup. And. Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be on the roster the rest of the season. They like his versatility. Again, plays both infield and outfield. Sam Haggerty's down there cooking in the minor leagues. And Josh Rojas, who's a guy who's notorious for not hitting the ball all that hard. And again, his small sample size and six at-bats has not hit a ball harder than 93 miles an hour. So take that as you will in my short analysis of, of Josh Rojas. We're going to contradict ourselves a little bit here because we were just talking about with Dom Canzone how a guy who's had that little big league experience needs time. You've got to ease him in. He's expected to make some real – he's expected to be a real force in the lineup down the road. Josh Rojas has also barely played. The difference with him is he has more big league time. And I know this isn't really fair to judge him off three games, but the at-bats he's had in the first few games have really not looked very good. There's a, a bit of a disclaimer. He did just come back from injury for about a month and a half when the Mariners traded for him. So he still could be working his way back a, a tiny bit. There's just, despite the value last season for Rojas, there's just not a ton to look forward to in the bat. And when Sam Haggerty is putting up a 133 WRC plus down in Tacoma and he runs the bases better, you would think, and might be a little more versatile in the outfield. And, you're probably a little more comfortable with Haggerty as well, seeing him for last season and what he did last year, then kind of tingles a little bit, but Jerry did just trade for him. So I would actually be kind of surprised if they, they sent him down this quick. It would be a shocker, but I do wonder if they're pondering the idea of bringing Haggerty up in exchange for Rojas. And I say that because you mentioned the WRC plus Haggerty's hitting 321 down there. He's OPSing 987. He's hit eight bombs. I know the PCL is a band box. We say it every show, every time we talk about AAA. We acknowledge it. But between his big league experience, the familiarity he already has with the club, the speed and defense he can play, and if he's hitting like this, you just have to wonder. Because the whole reason Haggerty got sent down to begin with is he wasn't hitting. But if he's hitting this well in Tacoma you have to wonder if they're starting to mull the idea of getting him another shot. It'll be something to to keep an eye on. I, I look forward to revisiting this probably in about a month or we'll probably at the end of the season when we, when we conclude and, and wrap up, we'll have a, we'll have a better sense for what these are, but just a week of review say that I still can't believe he Dom can zone hit four thirty a month. That's kind of absurd. He, uh, I, it, our, our friend, Jeremy, who works for the Mariners and is in Tacoma, he said, quote, like Canzone was the best hitter in, in AAA he saw all year. And I'd say that uh, that 430 mark kind of kind of checks all the boxes. The numbers back it up. Again, it's very similar to what Mitch Haniger did in the minors. When you look at their careers in the minor leagues and when they get up, got up to the big leagues, similar. And they both got traded to Seattle from the Diamondbacks. I, I'm not saying Canzone's going to be exactly that. I'm not sure Canzone has the same raw power that Mitch has. But I think there's a reason to believe he could be a good bat. We just got to give him a little time. And we should say, too, again, we're probably contradicting ourselves a little bit with Rojas. We shouldn't write him off after three games. He may turn around the next week and everything starts to click for him. But we're just judging off what he's done the first few games. We had a really fun conversation with Caleb Bro. Yes, that's how you pronounce it. It's pronounced B-R-O. It is spelled B. Uh, B-R-A-U-D. So don't get it confused. Bro. Right? Bro. So it, w- it was a fun conversation. It's good to get her perspective. An analyst on Root Sports. Also does a ton of work in college softball, which I have worked in as well. So good to tie in that. And it, it is good to get her perspective on a bunch of things. And I feel like we're uh, we're doing a good job of making our rounds in uh, in Root Sports. Yeah, we've had a lot of root people on so far, which is great. 
Kayla is seriously awesome. This is her first year on route and doing Mariner stuff. So if you're not familiar with her yet, this is a perfect chance to get familiar with her because re- she's really smart, outgoing, really knows what she's talking about. And overall, it was a really fun conversation. So hopefully you guys will start to get to listen to her and see her around more often on some of the route broadcasts, whether it's pregame and postgame. She was actually on one of the broadcasts doing color commentary this past week. I mean, she's awesome. She really is. So we're excited to have you guys hear this conversation with her. All right. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get to our interview with Kayla Bro. All right. We've got Kayla Bro on with us. She's a Mariners analyst for Root Sports college softball analyst for ESPN. Are we saying your name right? I mean, we tried to do our homework on this before we had you on. Yeah, it's Caleb Rowe. So uh, my dad is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the AUD is is another version of the EAUX. So it is, you don't pronounce the D, and it's like, you know, how they do the G-E-A-U-X for LSU, like go Tigers. That, that's where I'm at. So it's it's Caleb bro. Like, what's up, bro? <laughs> Did you, do you think it could possibly be cooler, though, with the EAUX on the end of it? Okay, yes. However, so I went to Lafayette. I called a game um, at Louisiana, which was the formal, formerly known as ULL. And a guy was telling me, and I don't know if he was, like, pulling my leg or not, but he was like, oh, you're with the smart bros. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, if you were illiterate, you put an X at the end. So I was like, oh, my family was the smart bros. I was like, I feel like you're pulling pulling my leg, but I will freaking take it. So, <laughs> What's the worst somebody's ever messed up your last name when they've tried to say it? Um, brand, probably. They just flip the U and turn it into an end. I get broad, and then people, my one of my teammates used to call me a dumb broad one time, you know. That's, that's, that's it. But uh, <laughs> it never gets... The only time it gets pronounced correctly is when I go to Louisiana. Well, that's good. Because I'm thinking, like, you played four years of college softball in in the SEC. You're on TV all the time. I mean, do you make it a point every game before – every time before the game started, you go up to the announcers, uh, by the way, let's let's, let's get this straight so I don't retweet a highlight of you saying broad instead. Yeah, you know, uh, for the most part – People are really good about asking because I think even if you just look at my name, you could mess it up just by looking at it. So, uh, yeah, I make sure. But I also like sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be a jerk and be like, well, it's actually bro, please. But it's your name. So you want you to be right. Well, that's awesome. And and I know you've had a nice journey now through through broadcasting. And this is your first season at, at Root. And you, you were just doing the game last night. And we figured it's kind of a pressing topic and pretty relevant to the time we're recording this that. The Mariners just win, headlined by a grand slam in the ninth inning from Cade Marlowe, where we figured the outfield was kind of a subject to headline here because, as it looks right now, they've got some new faces in there between Canzone, between Marlowe in the last couple of weeks. And we figured we'd just touch on a few of them with you. And to start with the guy that's headlined it all in the last few days in Cade Marlowe, I mean, what have you seen from him that's kind of made him pop so much in the first couple of weeks up here? Yeah, well, I laughed. I was looking at the things that we we're going to be talking about today, and we talked... We had you guys had this plan to talk about the outfielders yesterday before the game even started. So how perfect was it that Cade Marlowe goes hits a grand slam in the ninth inning? It, it just felt picture perfect today. Um, now Cade Marlowe has been, I think, a pleasant surprise. I don't think anybody had really high expectations of what he was going to be able to do. I think they saw him as a kind of a puzzle piece where you could put him in, plug and play, and kind of work around the Jared Kelnick injury. That being said where he's shined is he has had some really, really good veteran at bats that we've seen early in his career that you would expect out of somebody that's been playing the game a lot longer than he has at this level. So first and foremost, he has really good ABs. I think he's got a really good eye at the plate. Um, Obviously there's limitations because when you are a rookie, when you haven't seen major league pitching like that, um, it takes some transitionary time. So it's not perfect every single time, but he grinds out at bats. He puts bat on barrel. He's got a really simple swing. Like he doesn't have a, you know, beautiful, perfect swing that you're going to see some of the best hitters have in the league, but he's short. He's simple. doesn't have a lot of extra movement. So that allows him to get his barrel on ball very often. So those are some things that, that I've seen. It starts with his at bats first. And, you know, second of all, like, I think he's a good base runner. He's going to play a solid outfield for you. Um, And, you know, Last night was a great example of kind of the resiliency that you're going to see out of Cade Marlowe. So he gets two, like I think it was like 98 mile an hour heaters at the top of the strike zone that he whiffs at. And obviously, you know, Angel's saying, let's go at it again. Like this kid can't handle this stuff. Like he's late. He's 
way under. And Cade Marlowe did a really nice job of making an inbound adjustment. He gets his barrel head like perfectly on top of the ball. Because, I mean, again, at that level, you have to stay on plane, even kind of almost react above the plane of where you think it's going to be to make contact. And I thought he was under, under, and then boom, was on top of it and crushed a ball out of the park to give the Mariners the eventual win. So I, that's what I see. It's a long-winded answer, but that's what I see out of Cade Marlowe. I think, you know, he's got a lot of learning to do, but the the base and the foundation looks solid. And we've seen it from some of these young Mariner outfielders. And, and I was mentioning to Lyle on fri- last Friday's podcast when we were recording that, when we look at this outfield, when we look at the, the three guys you expect to be starters in the outfield in this 2023 season, I mean, you collectively get about a 30% strikeout rate, give or take. And that can wear people out a little bit. But but with Cade, right, even though he struck out a bunch in the minors, it, it doesn't seem like, at least at this point, that that's going to be a, a real issue for him. And just the, I would say the ability to, that you already mentioned, like with with two strikes and he's totally guessing there on that 100 mile an hour pitch and he guessed right act correctly i mean you as an outfielder right you you're thinking that's a, that's a total guess in that spot and if if he throws you a slider in the dirt uh you know you're spinning around like the top is if if you were in that box Kayla, is that is that kind of how you think of that at bat when he's when he's throwing gas up i mean you're guessing i'm i'm crushing the fastball and if he throws me a slider it's whatever yeah i think in that situation my mentality you're thinking I'm not going to get beat again by this pitch. So I'm going to sit fastball and I'm going to do whatever I can to react to the breaking ball, the off speed pitch down in the, like I thought, you know, I, I would have expected something down in the dirt as well. But I also think that, you know, you look at the kid and Gabe Marlowe, he's a rookie, not been in this situation before high, high pressure moment. You kind of go with the best stuff. And, you know, their reliever was having trouble finding the strike zone as well. So again, um, I, I was shocked, but again, to your point, yeah, you're, you're going to try to make sure you're not late on that pitch again. So you're going to be on time for the fastball and then try and keep your barrel and through the zone as long as humanly possible. If you are seeing the off speed and the breaking pitch, you're trying to stay in your legs as long as possible, but it's so tough. Um, but yeah, Cade Marlowe, again, for a, a rookie, I thought it was a good at bat and it may not seem like it because it's, you know, three of the same pitches over and over again, but sometimes those are the hardest ones to hit, you know, frankly. I want to ask you about, the guy he replaced your former athlete you played in some of the most high pressure important games that there are at this the sports level and you know he went to the college world series won a national championship in 2012 at alabama and we see this jared kelnick situation where emotions get the best of him and he puts himself out for the season by breaking his foot and kicking kicking a cooler has have you ever had a moment where i don't know if you broke your foot what where you can relate to jared in that moment where you where you find yourself at that crossroads of like, am I going to do something stupid after an at bat? Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's so funny that you said that. Cause I can vividly remember like my sophomore year, I'm playing in the women's college world series. We're getting our butts beat by Florida. Who's our like number one rival. And I struck out. We're like, we're down like nine runs. We're about to get eliminated from the season. Like I'm so mad. I'm frustrated. And I go into the dugout and I didn't like throw my bat, but like, put it down very forcefully, like made like a, you know, kind of jerk of myself in a way that like I typically don't do. And my coach, uh, my college coach at the time got us in like our huddle in the next inning. And he like called me out in front of the entire team and was like, you lack leadership. This is like unacceptable. You are not a leader in that moment for doing what you did. And it's a moment that like Jared Kelnick, I, will catalog in the back of my head and I didn't hurt myself, but you remember those moments and they sting and they hurt and they feel like crap, frankly, because you know that you did not act the way that you should in those moments. And I can tell you right now, I never did anything like that ever again. And I hope that's the case for Jared Kelnick in that learning moment where he does something that, you know, unfortunately injures himself. He takes himself out of the game. And now you have to have all these pieces fill in for him. And he was having a fantastic year. So I hope the mentality for him uh, shifts and he understands that he's too valuable to act like that. And and, uh, for me, it wasn't about injury. It was about value of being a leader and being impactful on my team. So I think that's what Jared Kelnick's going to be able to appreciate, move on from and learn from. And like I said, there's not a world where Jared Kelnick does something like that again. 
I was going to say, I think this all ties back in well, both your story and his story, because one, to your point, I don't think he has a situation, anything like this again. But I think fans sometimes forget to remember that athletes are human. And you just gave a great example of it. I mean, you were in a situation where it was incredibly frustrating in a game you were losing. For him, it was a guy that's one of the best closers in the league. It was a game the Mariners really needed. And I think fans sometimes sitting at home watching on TV just assume that every time you strike out, you're just going to shrug and forget about it. Oh, you know, the whole shake it off for next time type of mentality. It doesn't really go like that. I don't think anybody's happy that Kelnick broke his foot because he was a guy that was really relied upon this year. But I think people sometimes could do a better job of just realizing this game is so hard and these guys want to win so badly that just sometimes emotions do get to you. Without a doubt. And and that's the weird thing about being a fan and maybe not experiencing something at that level is everybody wants you to be ultra competitive. They want you to go up there and give it every single piece of yourself to the game, to winning for the Mariners. And then when you fail in those situations, they want you to be cool and humble and like, hey, be smart in those situations. And it's a very fine line. Like when you talk about writing like going over the edge either way. Cause you, again, you don't want somebody that doesn't care or is uncompetitive and you don't want somebody that takes those moments and kind of, again, um, hurts themselves or does something stupid or jeopardizes the success of the team. So um, for fans that want all of those things in a perfect world, but you know, Jared Kelnick, so many other athletes, they're human. And it's not because he's selfish. It's because he wanted to win. Like he, he's, he wants to win. Like the dude is a winner at heart. And I think that's where I can really relate to him. I hate losing like that feeling of walking off the field when you had an opportunity to win the ball game for your team and you don't come through is a sickening feeling. And again, not many people can say that they felt like that uh, in a big moment in their careers. So again, appreciating that everybody is human and there's going to be some times where you have learning experiences like Jared Kelnick and you move on and you still are upset, but you don't do something like kick a cooler <laughs> next time. <laughs> Maybe go into the corner, you know, get your frustration out, you know, stay within your, your body, not, not, not kicking or punching stuff. Yeah. Maybe next time he can just break a bat instead. That way it's just like a hundred dollars out of his back pocket instead of his foot. Yeah. I think there's like a punching bag in the clubhouse or something like that. Maybe you can go use that. <laughs> I think that's a pretty decent transition here, Kayla. Cause you've been, well, you've been talking about some experiences from your career and your time as a, collegiate athlete and college softball player. I'm sure people that are watching you now on TV, both during the pregame and postgame shows or on the broadcast you just did this past week, know that you have background in baseball and softball. But do you think Mariners fans know how good you were when you played? I mean, that booth all of a sudden is just filled with insane talent. Like I know, I'm sure people know you played, but do they, do you think, you know, they know that you hit like four or nearly 450 for your career in the SEC? Uh, probably not. I, I don't know how much homework fans do. There's been some uh, that there's been some softball fans that have you know reached out to me on Twitter, and they know because they follow the college softball landscape and Washington, a good team. So I, I've called some Washington games. Of you know covered them in the studio side when they're at the Women's College World Series. So uh, I don't think people know, but yeah, when you talk about me and Angie, you got a couple of All Americans. Angie's like a trailblazer. She was like one of the first All Americans at UW, um, playing softball and played professional baseball. Actually played professional baseball with my assistant coach at Alabama. So I actually had some ties to Angie uh, before I got this job at Root Sports. But um, I don't think people know. And I think uh, I don't I don't necessarily uh, care if they know. I want to have I, I want to feel like I have credibility, which I, I think I do. And um, obviously, I, I didn't suit up at the major league level, but suited up at the highest level in softball that you possibly can playing collegiately and playing for a national championship on a big stage. And really, you ask a lot of baseball players, softball players, the games are so similar. I think when you take the pitching out of it, which is obviously a huge piece, but, um, you know, analyzing a swing, breaking down an at-bat, outfield cuts, movement on the infield. You know, we had the double steal in the game with JP and, and Gino the other day. And I was sitting up in the booth and I laughed because it was so rare for a baseball game. And I was like, that happens like probably once a game, like once a weekend for softball programs, they just, they do the double seal all the time. Like that's a common play. So it's just, it's interesting. Um, I would love people to know that I, I'm credible, but it, it doesn't make any difference. I'm going to do my job and put my head down and make sure that I'm prepared and know my stuff more than anything. 
if you ask anyone who looks at ratings, they they would know that college softball is one of the fastest growing sports on television. No, you know, uh, parts of your coverage and, and ESPN's coverage as well with the Women's College World Series. So if someone hasn't started watching college softball, what's your pitch of why they should? Yeah, well, if you like the transition of baseball this year going to the pitch clock and how much faster it is, you're going to naturally already like softball because it has the same elements. It has those big moments, the home runs, the incredible athletes making phenomenal plays and it's faster so if you like the speed and pace of the new style of baseball you're going to get that from softball and even the defensive plays that you're going to see i think is really cool are even faster because turning a double play in baseball is relatively easy like turning a double play in softball is extremely hard because you have about you you have under three seconds to make a play and, and get the ball over to first if you want to have success throwing somebody out so again the pacing is really good um college softball there's not really a professional league right now. They're, they're trying to work on it. They're trying to implement professional softball. I think we got a long way to go before it becomes like a really, really great product. It's a good product right now, but it's just, there's, uh, you know, they're trying to get some footing under them to make it successful. But the college game right now is just unbelievable. And there's some teams like, if you haven't watched Oklahoma softball, that might be the best softball team of all time that are hitting the field year after year in the last two seasons just because their ability to hit the home run they're hitting like more than 130 home runs in 60 game spans a year it's it's unbelievable strong really talented females kicking ass out on the field i'm glad you brought up oklahoma because i really just have a burning question so last three seasons they've gone 176 and eight with three national championships does it at some point does it stop being fun to win all the time (laughs) i don't know if it stops being fun to win all the time but like Oh gosh, this is going to sound bad, but like from a coverage standpoint, you just like, well, they're good again. Like, duh. You know, I want, I want the competitive games. I want them to be um, challenged every single game. I want somebody to dethrone them. That makes covering the game more fun. But as a player, I can tell you right now, I loved beating the brakes off of people. Like that's the best part. So for them, they're having the time of their lives, just beating everybody and dominating almost every single game that they play. But uh, from a fan perspective, like, I would love to see a little bit more parody. Um, but again, it's making our whole sport better. Like they're making everybody have to rise and continue to get better and have these really dynamic ap- athletes that kind of like a Julio where you can like hit for power, you can steal bases really strong, but also extremely fast can do everything like, you know, the five tool players or whatever that you talk about. Um, that's what they are right now. Like a bunch of them. <laughs> the, the only bar they have left to clear is go undefeated and win a fourth consecutive. And that's it. Yep. That is- right that's that's all that's happened and I, I don't think anyone's ever won four straight have they i'm trying to think i don't think ucla ever did i don't think so or arizona i don't think so they traded off for a decade but that's it yeah they did yep the three peat i think is it so yeah oklahoma might do it and i know they just picked up another big transfer out of the portal yesterday so um so it's only gonna get better how different is it for you to break down baseball versus softball? I know you touched on it a little bit a minute ago, but when you started doing the Mariners games this year, was there that much of a transition? Uh, the transition, I think, for me, is there's so much more data in baseball. And there's a lot of, um, you know, the new Sabre metrics, all of the stat cast stuff. That just expands. So, I, I mean, I would find myself prepping for a baseball, you know, covering a studio show where, you know, maybe talking for 10 minutes and I'm – down a rabbit hole for two hours looking at somebody's stats, um, you know, on Wednesdays and facing left-handed pitchers, like in the month of May, like, you know, it's just insane how, how specific you can get. And um, that's where the biggest challenge was going into baseball is in softball. You have limited data and it's still really good data. And we continue to grow it every single year. We're like, there's so many new uh, metrics that are coming in for our sport of softball, but you just didn't have it. So you had to really, really, buy into the game that was on the field in baseball. There's just so much more that you can really analyze and look at spin rates, um, expected averages and all that stuff. So it's just really interesting um, weighted stuff that doesn't exist in softball. So understanding all of those and how they play into the game has been the biggest transition. And I think after that, um, obviously the pitching is different, just getting a feel for like, I've been watching baseball my whole life. So I I know what all the pitches are, but again, train changing your mentality, to think about at bats coming from those pitches and that style of movement versus a softball pitch that's coming in flatter, has the rise ball, has um, just a different movement plane, to be quite honest. That's really it. Uh, that 
that's all it changes is the plane that the pitch is coming in. So that's really, that's been the biggest challenge. How has the softball community embraced analytics? Have teams been rushing to get it or is there still some hesitancy? Um, yeah, teams have been rushing to get it. I think that's what you see is now every um, school is adding to their staff some kind of um, analytics uh, higher. They're having people that um, look at the data that like monitor every single swing and look up the algorithms best for your starting rotations, your starting lineups. We're seeing um, pitching change too. So um, because of a lot of that data and because of how much uh, information hitters have in softball now, which is new, you're seeing less complete games from pitching. And so you're seeing more baseball style pitching, which is going to be a starter role and then probably a reliever to a closer role, um, which like when I, even 10 years ago, when I finished my career, maybe you'd have like four people on the staff, your pitching staff. Now you're getting like six or seven pitches, pitchers on the staff, which is again, so different than what it used to be. But yeah, it, it's, it, it's changing the game for sure. Um, I think there's going to be some a transition um, to being comfortable with it and getting hitters in the right mentality to be able to use it effectively. But it's it's the best, it's part of the game now. And you said baseball has more data. I, I'm curious, is that on the pitching side compared to like all, all the numbers you have for someone's spin rate, spin axis, you know, uh, I forget all the other terminologies that are dug into baseball savant, but, but all the, all those other things that you look at, I mean, I feel like that's, that's where most of this looks at of how people, you know, attack their repertoires is, is, is that something that you think needs to be added a little bit more on the, on the softball side? And if so, how would it affect how people pitch besides just the strategy of like using your pitchers? What type of pitches do you think it affects the most? So that's a, it's a great point. And I've seen in more and more bullpens, they're having the, like the technology that can read all of those metrics that they can read the spin rate. And that's, what's interesting. You talk to some of these baseball pitchers and there's like an algorithm that can tell them, Hey, if you move your finger like a quarter of an inch, you know, a little bit further North and you release it and you put like a tiny bit more pressure on this point right here, your spin rate will go up. Like there are like ways that you can teach and tell a pitcher how to improve their release point and their pitches immediately with the technology. And now we're starting to see that in softball where you're getting immediate feedback on, oh, that pitch didn't have as much spin. And here's why that pitch didn't have as much movement. Here's why. Here's what you need to do. And here's the the point of release that you need, the, the grip that you need to have to better those pitches. So um, that's where I'm going to see the biggest change in softball and pitching. And I think you're going to see it affect pitches like the rise ball a lot. The rise ball is the most deadly pitch. It's like the high heater in baseball. Instead of just sitting flat, you know, the best fastballs at the top of the strike zone, the four seamers, are the ones that don't dip down with gravity as much as the other ones. Well, the rise ball defies gravity and it actually comes up. So if pitchers improve that pitch, it's one of the hardest pitches to pitch hit. And you see all these like softball pitchers that go out and face baseball players and they strike them out. It's they throw the rise ball because you just baseball players aren't used to it. They have no chance. So that those are the those are the types of pitches that it will definitely impact. Will you guys break this stuff down on softball broadcasts a lot? Like I know in baseball, some broadcast teams decide to throw analytics into the broadcast. I think the Mariners do a really good job of that. Some don't. Like, do you guys talk about it a lot? We're starting to. Yeah, we um, uh, specifically at ESPN, they just. Uh, partnered with like a 643 charts, which is a, a database company that just has all of that stuff on hand. And that's becoming more common is to import that into our broadcast and really analyze that data, show video to back it and support all of those types of things, things that have been baseball for a while now, those are starting to come through a little bit more. And um, even just like, kind of there's like speed ratings now in softball, that wasn't a thing. Um, all of these new algorithms that help you measure not only the value of a player from or just like, oh, they can hit the ball really far. Like there's so many other uh, things. Their exit be low, how fast they're getting around the bases, um, their quality ABs, all that, all that kind of stuff. We're, in, we're inserting that into our softball broadcast a lot more because I think what's different is softball started and people had to be taught. We don't need to teach people anymore about softball. Like people know, people know the game. There's a huge audience. They're very dedicated, smart fans. So we don't have to teach them anything now. We have to enhance the game and show them why something is happening. And here's data to back it up. Here's what's going on. And here's the numbers behind what is happening. So that's been a really cool transition and something that um, 
our softball team talks about a lot and ways that we continue to try and grow the game. Kayla, I want to ask a little bit how about how you got into the media space. I did was reading that article on Barrett Sports Media about you, and I thought this was this was fascinating that you did want to do broadcasting at Alabama, but you had an academic advisor who told you, no, you you know, broadcasting doesn't usually work out. You should you should try something else. So I, I got a good chuckle at that. But I mean, the question I have is, I mean, did you ever go up to your coach and be like, all right, when I'm on the bench and everyone else is at bat, like, could you throw the ESPN headset on me and 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 let me get some some early reps in here? I'd, I, I feel like I need I, I need to get started. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. So when I wanted to switch to broadcasting, I actually wanted to be behind the camera. I thought I would be a good producer. I thought that I, I just loved watching sports. I wanted to be involved in sports and uh, TV. When I was a little kid, I loved movies. So I wanted to be like a movie director. You know, every kid has like their big time dream. I wanted to go to L.A. and I wanted to go to USC or LMU and go make movies. And then obviously like softball happened and you when you're not. 12 years old, you figure like, oh, life's a little different than I expected. So I wanted to be behind the camera and broadcasting. I thought it would be cool to be in a truck and um, work in that capacity. So I, I wasn't really itching to get in front of the camera, ironically. Um, and so when I talked to my academic advisor, I was kind of like a little bit shocked, but it, it, it was what it was and um, moved on with my life and got my degree and it worked out anyway. But um, when my boss called me from ESPN and said, Hey, we're starting this thing called the SEC network. Do you want to be a part of it? I like jumped at the opportunity. I was all about it. And, you know, when I was playing and I didn't realize this at the time, but a lot of girls on my team didn't want to do like the newspaper interviews every day, go talk to the media. Cause we would have media sessions, uh, once or twice a week that, you know, the Tuscaloosa news would come by or the student newspaper or the local news outlet. And I was always the, you know, sacrificial lamb to go out and do that kind of stuff. And I took it really seriously. And so when ESPN covered all of our stuff at the women's college world series, I mean, it was just normal for me. Like I got in front of the camera, had no problem, was well-spoken enough to, you know, peak the attention of my boss and end up landing me a job. So, um, I, I tell kids this all the time because people want a story where, oh, I just, I wanted to be a broadcaster forever. And I did this and I worked really hard to, I did the school media. I, you know, I didn't do all of those things, but what I did do was I had the opportunity to get in front of the camera. I took it really seriously and I volunteered for opportunities to speak on behalf of my team. And the other thing that I tell people all the time, and I don't even know if this is in the article or not, but I told people that when I did those interviews, and this is something I learned from my college coach, is I shook every person's hand. I said, hi, I'm Caleb Rowe. It's so nice to meet you. What do you do at ESPN? What's your job? And my boss at ESPN remembered that. She said, you treated everybody really nicely. You asked them what position that they did. You were just excited to be there and happy to be there. And that was a big piece on why you stood out. So uh, you just never know what a handshake and just being the best version of yourself can do and not shaking off opportunities to build your brand or um, be a, a good representative of your university at the time or your job or your life or whatever it is, you know? What pushed you to still do broadcasting anyway? Like even after your academic advisor said, don't do it. Cause it's two people who have sports journalism degrees and see all these people just give up so fast. And we're in the early stages trying to figure it out. Sports media is hard, but you've, pu you've pushed through it and made it happen for yourself anyway. So what really still pushed you to continue with it? Yeah, I can tell you right now, what pushed me was the feeling that I got the first time I was in the booth. So I got thrown into the fire. Like I got hired at ESPN and my first job was go be in the booth with Michelle Smith, who is like our lead analyst at ESPN. So I sat in the booth with um, Pam Ward, who calls at WNBA games now, college softball games, you name it for ESPN, and Michelle Smith. And I can tell you right now, I got the same, like, good butterflies, adrenaline, that same feeling that I got when I played. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I don't think there's another job on the planet right now that will give me the same feeling, like, suiting up and getting out on the field and going to play in a game. Because you have to perform. You have to be the best version of yourself, you have to like be ready to um, and prepare to tell a story. And um, that really got me going. And that's kind of when I knew I was like, okay, this is for me. And that's kind of been the driving force um, behind continuing to grind and work at this job. And I can tell you, I've, I've had years where it's been, hey, you're only doing 10 games and 
you, you just you're dying for reps and you want to continue to get better and then the covid year happened and um you know basically I had to take a year off of doing tv so um it was a grind and it's still remains one of the toughest things I'll do and still makes me want to pull my hair out sometimes but the feeling of kind of being competitive and you know getting the bright lights on you it feels like competing and feels like playing so that's why I continue to do it and the thing for you is you're a true student of the game I've read that you're you were watching Kirk Herbstreit is one of my favorite. And then like taking notes, like how does he break down a play and, and all these other things? Who are some other people that are like really good to learn from of this is, this is what qualifies good analysis. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because the people that I like to listen to are really clear. They find a way to explain the game to you in a simple way, but with confidence and, um, kind of a unique way. Like I like listening to Doris Burke and Kirk Herbstreit. Um, me, She's on our softball team, but Amanda Scarborough is one of my favorite people to listen to. Uh, she breaks down the game in such a unique, cool way. And so when I think about all of the the people that I really like to listen to, the the key piece is they're very clear and they explain the game in a way that's not overcomplicated, but not dumbed down. Like they relate to the often the they relate to the audience. I feel like they're talking to me when they're talking about a game and they know when to be light and to have fun and not take the game in themselves too seriously. And that's what I want to do is I want to make sure that I am still myself, but I want somebody to leave a game that I've called or a studio show. I'm like, Oh, that's a really good insight. It's a good way to look at it. It's a unique perspective. That makes sense. That's, that's what I want viewers to walk away with. And that's what I always look for when I'm listening to somebody call a game. And, you know, I think, it's been really fun this year listening to all the Mariners broadcasts because I think every single analyst in the Mariners organization and just on Root Sports has a unique perspective. And I take little nuggets from each and every single one of them, and it helps me become a better broadcaster, too. So it's been really fun to be on this team, too, and get to experience some new people that do their jobs really well. If we had one last question for you, Kayla, is there a single favorite or best thing that you've been taught about broadcasting since doing it? Like, is there one single thing that you've learned from somebody and say, I've always back pocketed that forever? That is a, that is an interesting question. Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if there's been one thing that sticks out, but I can tell you right now, um, I think about a couple people that really helped me in my career and those two people. So they both were a uh, host at the SEC network and that's going to be Maria Taylor and Laura Rutledge. So I got, they're like too big. They're so big time. And I'm so lucky because they were at the SEC network for about a year. And each of the times that my first three seasons, they were with me um, as the network started. And for both of them, I'll always thank Maria Taylor because um, she taught me, the ins and outs of TV because at the time I didn't major in broadcasting. So I didn't know all of the ins and outs. So she taught me how to read a rundown and how to deliver things emphatically and um, how to pace myself throughout a broadcast and a show. And on the other side of that, um, I thought Laura Rutledge reminded me to be myself above like anything else. Like she is the most like charismatic, her unique self. When, when I tell you guys, like, how she is on TV is how she is in person. She's like the nicest, most fun, like awesome person and finds a way to keep things like rolling and throughout the show. And she weaves in her own stories. She brings it back to you in the, this beautiful way. And, and she's again, herself. So um, in a world, especially for a woman, you know, there's uh, a lot that people want you to be a certain way and they want you to not, you know, be yourself a lot of the time but those two women um, have really taught me to be myself and taught me a lot about kind of the foundational pieces of broadcasting um so that's that for me those were two very impactful people but yeah I think beyond that um I mean I still learn something new every single day <laughs> well that means you're just getting better and better every time because nobody's ever a finished product that's right yeah that's right well, Kayla, this has been awesome. We really appreciate all the time you've given us. We enjoyed having the conversation with you. It's been really fun getting to know you out at the ballpark, and we certainly hope to do this again soon. Right. Hey, right back at you guys. Uh, it's been awesome, and I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys, and uh, TJ and Lyle, I will see you back at the ballpark sometime. 
Really enjoyed that conversation with Caleb Rowe. Hopefully you guys got to learn a little bit more about the newest member of the Root Broadcast team. Because like we said before the start of the interview, she really is awesome. And we love getting a chance to talk to her. That'll just about wrap up this edition of the Marine Layer Podcast. You guys know the drill. If you want to listen to the Full Form Podcast, you can check us out on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon. If you do so, go follow us, download our episodes, give us a five-star review. That really helps us big time. And if you want to check us out on the video side, head over to YouTube too. We do a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Go hit subscribe, like, comment, turn the notification bells on. That way when you'll, you'll know whenever we post something. On social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts, go check us out. Follow us at Marine Layer Pod. That's TJ. I'm Lyle. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.